Good morning, everyone. Before I start, I would like to welcome my professors and my colleagues. Our topic talks about management of impacted teeth. So whether you were in the dental field or not, you may have done this procedure for a patient before, or you may know someone who had gone through it. So what is impaction? An impacted tooth is one that has not erupted to its functional position in the occlusion plate and does not show any clinical or radiographical features indicating that it may erupt. And those are the most common impacted teeth. In some cases, the impacted teeth are left without any surgical interventions, but in other cases, if left untreated, it may lead to formation of one of the following. Either it may lead to an erosion cavity, an infection, crowding of teeth, which may lead later to a need of orthodontic treatment, or formation of a cyst. Starting with the most common impacted tooth, which is the lower third molar, and with the guidelines of its extraction. For the American and oral maxillofacial surgeons, in their point of view, asymptomatic does not mean disease-free. So they firmly support the surgical management of impacted tooth and extracting it. On the other hand, for the NHS in UK, the surgical removal of impacted tooth is not very preferable. It is limited only for patients who have a severe uh, recurrent episode of brake coronitis. For the classifications, we have Winters, which classifies the impacted lower third molar accord according to its angulation. So we have the mesial angulation, which forms 45% of the cases, then the vertical, horizontal, distal angulation, and the inverted one in less percentages. And for the Paul and Gregory classifications, it classified the impacted lower third molar according to its relationship with the ramus of the mandible and the uh, lower second molar. So it's either a class one, if the impacted third molar was below the occlusal plane of the uh, lower second molar and classified as class two, if it was uh, between the occlusal plane and the cervical line and classified as class three, if it was below the cervical line of the second molar. And there is another classification, which is the American Dental Association that they classified it according to the overlying uh, soft tissue and one. So we have an impacted tooth with no overlying soft tissue, an impacted tooth with partial bony impaction, complete bony impaction, and complete bony impaction with unusual surgical complications. Before we take the surgical management of this tooth, we have to take a radiographical investigations for the patient. So we have the intraoral radiographs. The periapical view is the most common available uh, one in our clinics, but given to the position of the impacted third molar, it's sometimes hard to obtain a um, correctly positioned periapical view. So the OPG is the most common method. And one of the advantages of taking a radiograph is seeing the features indicating the close relationship between the inferior alveolar nerve and the impacted third molar. So if there is a darkening of roots, deflecting of roots, uh, dark pifid apex, narrowing of canal, diversion of canal, they are all indicates that there is a close relationship. But we should keep in mind that uh, the OPG is two-dimensional uh, uh, radiograph. So sometimes it's not enough, and we can use the 3D dimension, which is the CBCT, if we uh, want to see the exact location of the impacted third molar. Now we will start with the surgical management of the lower impacted third molar. The steps in general, first we will do the anesthesia, the incision and new proprioceal flap design, removal of bone, elevation, sectioning of tooth, which is an optional, and wound debridement, achieve hemostasis, and wound closure and post-operative follow-up. First, we will start with the anesthesia. 
The most common anesthetic agent used in this procedure is the 2% of lidocaine concentration that uh, has uh, 1 to 1,000 of epinephrine. And for the technique, we will use the conventional technique of anesthetizing the inferior alveolar nerve block. The syringe should be introduced from the lower premolar teeth of the other side, parallel to and 0.5 to 1 centimeter above the lower occlusal plane. Then the needle should be advanced 2 to 2.5 centimeters until it touches the bone and then slightly withdrawn a millimeter or two. And don't forget uh, for putting a few drops before taking out the syringe to anesthetizing the lingual nerve. And for the general anesthesia, it's sometimes used if uh, we have an uncooperative patient or we have a mentally retarded patient and if we have to extract more than one tooth of uh, the impacted molars. Before we jump into the incisions and the flap designs, we have uh, to memorize uh, the surgical anatomy briefly about uh, this area. So we have the nerves, the vessels, and the muscles. For the nerves, we have the lingual nerve that pass medially to this area, and we have the long buccal nerve which pass distally to the impacted lower third molar. For the vessels, we have the facial artery and facial vein that passes it with a proximity with the second molar. And we have also the mandibular branches which supplies the temporalis tendon. For the muscles, the boxinator muscle the vestibule is formed by the boxinator muscle, buccally, and the mylohyoid muscle, lingually. Now I will start with the incision and mucopheresial flap design. The most common two types of flaps are the envelope flap and the triangular flap. Both flaps start distally by making a horizontal flap on the interior border of the ramus of the mandible and the slightly lateral to it and continuing with incision on the buccal sulcus of the seven. And from here, we either continue to make the incision on the buccal sulcus of the six, just like in the envelope flap, or we continue to downwards uh, to make an incision vertically below the tooth. For the complications that may arise during this step, if we extend the incision too distally, it either may lead to one of the three following, either uh, injury to the buccal vessels and other arteries, uh, temporal muscle damage, or herniation of the buccal fat pad. And if extended lingually, it may lead to lingual nerve damage. For the bone removal, there is a nice quote that I read in the maxillofacial book that says, bone belongs to the patient and tooth belongs to the dentist. So according to this, we should minimize the amount of bone removed as much as possible. The bone is removed either by the help of an burrs and the uh, handpiece motor or by chisel and mallet. The chisel and mallet is not a very uh, preferable method. So if the first one is available, it's most common used one. And the fo for the complications that may arise for this step, if we use the handpiece embers, either it may lead to slipping over into the soft tissue and causing injury, subcutaneous emphysema, and extraoral and mucosal burns. And if we use the chisel and mallet, it may lead to fracture of the mandible. And the degree of bone removal is depending on many factors, such as depth of impaction, morphology of roots, and the angulation of the impacted tooth. So as we can see here in A, there is a slight bone removal. And in B, there is a moderate bone removal. And in C, there is a deep bone removal because the tooth is completely impacted. For the elevation and extraction of tooth, we use the dental elevators. And the complications that may arise during this step are many, but the most common ones are luxation of neighboring tooth, 
and soft tissue injury due to slipping of elevator, breakage of instrument, and TMJ dislocation. Now the next step is odontectomy, which is an optional step and should be done by a specialist and have good experience. And the two sectioning here is depending on the type and degree of the impaction, as we can see here in this photo. And the indication for this procedure is we have a deeply impacted uh, third molar and uh, we have uh, a proximity with the inferior alveolar nerve. And the advantages for this procedure is uh, the bone that we remove is less and we minimize the risk of injury to the inferior alveolar nerve. So here after doing the incision and elevating the soft tissue. He started to do the bone remover. And in this case, he used the tooth sectioning and started elevating by the dental elevator. And after the extraction, we should make sure that there is no any fragment left in the socket and then do the irrigation by the normal saline and the cleaning of the socket and making initial suturing. And for the suturing, the most common needle used in this procedure is the curved needle, uh, which allow the passage uh, in a small area, unlike the um, straight needle. And for the size of the needle is the most common use sizes are the 3 uh, eighths and the half uh, curved needle. And for the suture, the most common suture used is the 3-0 black silk non-absorbable. And for the technique, the most common technique used is the simple uh, interrupting technique. For the post-operative instructions, they are very important for the uh, increasing the success rate of the um, surgery. So they should uh, put a pressure pack ice application and soft diet for the first two days. The first dose of analgesics should be taken before the anesthetic effect of uh, local anesthetic wears off because uh, sometimes the pain uh, is uh, unbearable. Uh, and of course, it depends on the threshold pain of the patient. We should avoid gargling, spitting, drinking with straw to avoid the negative pressure and avoid smoking. Smoking is not a good idea because it may lead to uh, delay the healing. And warm water saline gargling after 24 hours and using mouthwash. And the suture is removed uh, on the seventh day of the post-operative. For the post-operative complications, there is an immediate complications which are hemorrhage, pain, an edema because of an excessive tooth manipulation, and drug interaction. There is a delayed complications, which is first we have the trismus, which is a common uh, temporary uh, complication after the surgery, and uh, it's relieved after three to four days. And we have the infection or having alveolitis as a complication, but it's uncommon. Then we have the dry socket, which is a common complication uh, because every one to five patients which uh, have done this procedure, they have a dry socket and the symptoms are moderate to severe pain, develops generally on, on the three to four day of the procedure and the pain radiates to the ear. And the most common sign of this uh, complication is the bad odor. It's so obvious. Last, we have the coronectomy, which means we remove the crown of the impacted tooth and leaving the uh, roots behind. The indications if, uh, for this procedure, if there is a deeply impacted uh, third molar, uh, which we uh, take previously if it was uh, type C, and if there is a very proximity with the inferior alveolar nerve. The advantage of this procedure is when we remove the crown, the tooth becomes non-functional. So 
the roots become resorbed and with the resorption and remodeling of the alveolar bone, it becomes superficial and uh, it becomes easily to remove. And for the disadvantage of this procedure, it either may lead to an infection in the area or it may lead to formation of pathology because of the uh, recurrent roots. And thank you. Hello and welcome. It's Aisha Ziad with you. I'm going to talk about the second most commonly tooth to be impacted after the mandibular third molar, which is the maxillary canine. To talk about what should I uh, know about impaction, the classifications, the radiographs and their importance, and the clinical management of some cases. What should I seek dental help? This usually have uh, something to do with the eruption time. I should know the eruption, the exact impact, uh, eruption time to know when uh, there is uh, some some problem. Eruption time of the maxillary canine in this case starts uh, about around the age of 11 to 12 and the root is completed between the 13 to 15 years of age. So I should start concerning if the tooth did it start erupting at, uh, after the age of 12. Uh, uh, there are some factors that influence the, uh, the impaction. Systemic factors and local factors. The systemic factors are genetic disorders, endocrine deficiencies, previous irradiation to the jaws that, that's uh, associated with the failure of a tooth to erupt. In this case, not only the maxillary canine is uh, affected, uh, numerous teeth in the jaw might be affected with the radiation. The local factors, mechanical obstruction, that I have something that, that's blocking out the way of the tooth, like supernumerary teeth, a cyst or a tumor. Insufficient space in the dental arch, uh, the tooth has no space to get out, so it stays in its place. Uh, and the premature loss of the deciduous tooth. As we know that the C has the guide for the path of eruption of the permanent canine. So if I lose the C, the, the, the guide will be lost. So, 8% of all patients with impacted canines have bilateral impaction, just like this picture. Okay, next. When I talk, when I uh, read about the subject, I hear about something that's called ectopic canine and an impacted canine. The ectopic canine is the one that's following an abnormal path of eruption in the maxilla, and the impacted canine is the one that's blocked from erupting by a physical barrier, just like we've mentioned before. Ectopic eruption might lead to impaction. Now, while I was preparing for this presentation, I found several uh, classifications. The most commonly used one was uh, the classification according to the axial inclination. It has five classes and uh, five basic classes. The first class is the first class is a palatally impacted canine. The second class, as the picture sh shows, a buccal side impaction. Uh, they both have horizontal, vertical, and semi-vertical uh, sub-classification. Class 3 is for both palatally and buccally uh, impacted in the alveolar uh, bone. Fourth class is uh, horizontally impacted between the incisors and the premolars. Uh, and class 5 is for uh, canine impacted in the edentulous maxilla. If uh, the tooth is not in any of these position, positions, it's in class 6, which is an abnormal position, which is might be in the antral wall or the infraorbital region. Next, the radiographs. They are the second most uh, important thing to do after clinical examination, to evaluate the condition. I have the intraoral and the extraoral radiographic techniques. First, the periapical films, which shows me a close look to the uh, uh, to the impacted tooth, the stage of its development, uh, the presence and absence uh, of uh, supernumerary teeth, maybe, uh, indicates uh, the soft tissue lesions, indicates the root resorption of the tooth itself or the teeth in the uh, around it. Uh, 
like this uh, pretty epical film here and the second one here extra oral radiography instead of having too many uh, small peri -epical films i can have one picture for whole the mouth from the right mj to the left to the left mj which is the opg it has a, an advantage of quickly and simply viewing the information about the teeth and the, and the jaws like this uh, opg film it shows a patient during the orthodontic treatment and this picture here and, uh, number two shows uh, left and number three uh, left maxillary and mandibular impacted canines for those uh, the previous pictures were 2d in 2d dimension for more recent uh, recently the more the most recently used technique is the 3d imaging which is the cbct uh, which uh, would show me more details is the computer the computed uh, the cone beam computed topography like these pictures of CBCT scans okay now for the management of the cases uh, factors that may influence the treatment decision are multifactorial so the first one is the position of the canine whether it was a favorable one or not the age of the patient, availability of the space uh, in the dental arch, and the presence of the decoit with uh, of attached gingiva. Some many features that determine the prognosis of the cases: uh, the, over, the overlap. The first feature is the overlap of the incisors. If I have the the less the overlap was, the better the prognosis. So, good prognosis with no overlap. The second uh, feature is. The vertical height uh, is the height from the uh, cemento enamel junction. The tooth, uh, when it's near the cemento enamel junction, I have better prognosis. The angulation is also a good uh, feature of determining the prognosis. And the position of the apex of the canine, if it was the ab above the canine apex, it's better. And uh, I have poor prognosis when it gets uh, above the second premolar. Now for the clinical uh, examination. Now to the clinical examination, which is the key to identify the ectopic canine. Now palpation of the maxillary canine should start uh, at the age of uh, uh, nine. If I have no ca buccal canine bulge and I cannot, uh, I cannot palpate it like the picture sh shows, it's an indication that I I might have an ectopic canine. The presence of the palatal swelling, it indicates a palatally positioning canine. The lack of the mobility of the deciduous canine also is an indication to the ectopic canine presence. And a uh, lack of uh, space in the dental arch and the angulation of the lateral incisor. Now to the management options for ectopic canines. First, an interceptive extraction for the deciduous canine. Uh, with doing this, I'm making a space for for the ectopic canine to go back to its place without needing any uh, orthodontic treatment. I have a 91% of uh, get, uh, of getting it back to its place without uh, needing an orthodontic treatment if the crown of the ectopic canine did it pass the midline of the adjacent tooth which is in, in this case the lateral incisor if it passed i will lose this percentage of uh, getting it back to its place without uh, orthodontic treatment the second one is the surgical exposure and orthodontic alignment at the picture a extraction of the c is done picture b uh, golden chain is attached to the to the moving canine and it got back to its place the third option is the surgical removal of the ectopic canine which is i'm going to talk about in this the next slide and i have the option of uh, transplantation and leave and monitor leave and monitor if the patient desire was not to go to go through any surgical procedures or any orthodontic treatments next the surgical removal of the ectopic canine uh, indication to extract the surgical canine is what well, if the tooth was in enclosed 
uh, if, if it cannot be transplanted, the root has undergone uh, that resorption, and the, or the tooth was dilacerated. The occlusion was good and acceptable, and I have no pathological changes. Now, the steps of the surgical ex extraction, and this from the picture A to the picture B, a semilunar flap in the picture B is done, and bone uh, and the tooth was exposed. Then uh, suctioning with the bear and extraction, normal extraction with um, so, uh, resuturing of the space. And from this picture F here to the J, uh, I have a palatally positioned ectopic canine, and normal removal was done. Here another picture. Now the surgical exposure, it's indicated when the tooth doesn't erupt spontaneously uh, after creating a, a, a space in the dental arch. I have two basic uh, approaches for, uh, for uh, exposure, the open eruption technique and the uh, closed eruption technique. The first one is the open eruption technique. Now soft tissue and bone is removed around the crown of the tooth. Uh, this remains open to the oral environment after creating the space at the end of the procedure. The, procedure. Uh, the cut of tissue is, prevent is prevented from rehealing by placing a surgical pack. The surgical pack is removed after two to three weeks after the treatment to permit healing. And then uh, an orthodontic may uh, place uh, may. Uh, an orthodontic appliance may be placed over the tooth to trace it back to its position. Now, this is the first case of the open ex uh, exposure technique. I have an excisional approach because the crown in the first picture here is uh, located coronal to the mucogingival junction. Open eruption technique is done. After nine months, the tooth is uh, at its place without orthodontic help. An apically positioned flap is when the tooth is apical to the mucogingival junction. Uh, as this first picture, a circular incision was done above the tooth, and with the help of orthodontic uh, uh, treatment, it's got this place. A simple palatal impaction is also indicated uh, for uh, also indicates an open eruption exposure technique. The closed eruption exposure technique, uh, we make a wide surgical flap and uh, bone overlying it, uh, overlying the tooth is removed. In this case, I have a deeply impacted tooth, deeply in the bone. So I cannot op uh, make an open surgical technique. Uh, the third uh, step is the orthodontic bonds are used, a twisted steel ligator or a golden chain is placed. The surgical uh, flap is then resutured to its former place, just like this picture. It's resutured and the tooth is pulled to its place. Now, the tunnel approach is a modification of the closed surgical uh, technique. Uh, we make a surgical buckle flap here. For the impacted mandibular canines, I have uh, now to another subject, of course. Uh, the classifications of it start. Uh, depending on the cervical line. So I have level A, that's at the cervical line. Level B, between the cervical line and the root apex, the level C is uh, beneath the root apex of the adjacent tooth. Mandibular canine here uh, has uh, three uh, level C, sorry, which has been extracted. Now for the mandibular premolar impaction. I have many cases, like several cases, for impaction of uh, premolars. Uh, it counts. It accounts 24% of all um, uh, impactions, uh, excluding, of course, the molars. The premolar may be impacted due to local factors, uh, what, like mesial drift of the teeth, ectopic positioning of the premolar bud. It's not in its position, uh, and the pathology like the dentigerous cysts. Various treatment methods have been suggesting included observation, interceptive treatment with orthodontic, uh, surgical exposure with orthodontic treatment, transplantation and extraction. For the extraction, I have depending 
uh, if I have made this decision, depending on the position of the impacted tooth, the relationship with the adjacent tooth, and the need of the orthodontic treatment. This picture is showing an orthodontic treatment, and this is surgical removal. Thank you very much for making it to the end. I hope you're all doing well and uh, stay well protected during this quarantine time.